I thought I'd talk a little bit about how we can help you all in terms of pre-op and post-op eval of visual function in these patients that have tumors that are near the afferent visual pathway. And you probably already know enough about visual fields, but I thought I'd talk, highlight you know, a couple of things that are new that we use in our tool basket to assess these patients, one of them being uh, low contrast visual acuity test and the other being primarily OCT, optical coherence tomography, which I'm not really certain how much neurosurgery knows about that, but you all can tell me how much you already know about that. So we have a lot of ways of assessing optic nerve function in patients, This, whether it be a surgical patient or an MS patient. We have an MSI clinic, we see MS patients. The old, the old standards of visual acuity with 100% contrast. And now what we're doing for all the MS patients is low contrast letter acuity testing, and I'll show you that. That's much more sensitive for picking, picking up de deficits in patients and more correlated with li real life uh, visual function. We have visual field testing, color vision. We don't use VEPs very much personally because we think we have other ways of assessing optic nerve function. MRI, of course, we look at the nerve still, although uh, it's, it's questionable how much people do that in terms of who are not neuro-ophthalmologists. And the latest tool is the OCT, which I'm gonna tell you a little bit about. The contrast sensitivity testing used to be uh, complicated and done with these sinusoidal grids that we did for the optic neuritis trial. And we showed that in optic neuritis, about a third of patients have persistent deficits in low contrast vision, which correlates with poor nighttime driving and poor vision in dim lighting conditions. And here's the difference in the old charts that you used to see in the family practice office, maybe in neurosurgery. These charts were really seriously flawed because people, uh, they memorize them. You see there's not an equal number of letters on every line. Uh, there's a lot, of, some letters have been shown to be much easier to see than others, like T, for instance, or, or O. So we changed the charts, so now the charts have typically the same number of letters on every line. This is a low contrast um, acuity chart, and you'll see the letters are evenly spaced, unlike this chart. Same number of letters in every line, and these are various shades of gray for low contrast testing. We use 4.5% for MS patients, and it gets quite difficult to see the smaller letters with low contrast. And it correlates very highly with the OCT findings and also patient's subjective visual function, as you'll see. So it's more sensitive than the 100% high contrast that's used in all the optometrists' office and most ophthalmologists. And it may be adapted by the Department of Licensing for vehicle uh, screening for people because it's much better in, in terms of assessing for night vision driving, for instance. So this is the OCT, which is another uh, tool that we have. And this was developed at, at uh, MIT and also partly at Harvard in the 1980s, 1990s, and was first used for corneal assessment and then ultimately retina. Now it's been adopted for glaucoma and optic and nerve diseases of uh, various types. And it's a pretty small machine. This is the latest uh, version of it. There's been several generations. So let me just tell you a little bit about this. If we go to the anatomy of the eye, and here's the optic nerve head, and you can see the optic nerve here, which is myelinated behind the lamina cribosa. But if you look in the retina around the optic nerve, you see the layers of the retina. Superficial layers are the non-myelinated uh, axons that are going to form the optic nerve. And they originate from the ganglion cell layer, which is immediately under the nerve fiber layer. So that's what we're going to be concentrating on. And we're above the layer of the rods and cones, which is at the bottom of the retina. When this is looking in the eye from the, from the uh, outside in. So here is a microscopic picture, which nicely shows all the layers of the retina. And the OCT now, sort of like a high-grade ultrasound, but it's low-intensity infrared light, can now segment uh, the, the retina into different parts. We can just look at the nerve fiber layer. We can look at the ganglion cell layer with the inner plexiform layer. That's another software set that we use. And the retina people, of course, are looking down further into the layers, all the layers and the rods and cones as well. So here's a very, very high-grade uh, OCT, probably produced from MIT. And you can see here is the nerve fiber layer here, 
coming up to the fovea in the macula. And underneath it is the ganglion cell layer where the axons originate for the nerve fiber layer. And that's what we're interested in for your surgical patients. So in MS, we've shown multiple studies that you can look at retinal nerve fiber layer thickness, which thins with MS, especially with optic neuritis. Ganglion cell layer, which is immediately underneath, is even more sensitive and less prone to uh, misinterpretation. If there's swelling of the optic nerve, you're going to see elevation or thickening and not atrophy, and so that will mislead you. But with the GCL, it's done on the macula, so you have no worries about optic nerve swelling. And patients with diseases like NMO have way more uh, significant loss of both RNFL and GCL after an attack of optic neuritis. So this is shown to be correlating. There's a significant drop in these MS patients. There's about 2 micron drop per year versus 0.2 in normal aging. So there is a normal drop off of all of these things in our lifetime. About 20 microns in a, in a person's lifetime over 60 years highly accelerated, say, in MS patients. In a normal eye, this is what an OCT looks like. So we, we run around the optic nerve here, the machine measures, and prints it out in quadrant picture. Healthy within stu two standard deviations in terms of thickness will be green or white. Yellow is borderline thin, and red is some atrophy or thinning of the nerve fiber layer. So this is a normal one. This is what you see a month after optic neuritis in the right eye. Right away, you see ganglion cell thinning in the affected eye, and the normal eye is intact. You won't see retinal nerve fiber layer thinning for three to four months out after an attack like optic neuritis. So if you wait six months after optic neuritis, this one in the left eye, what you commonly see is a significant difference in the average thickness 107 versus 88 microns, and you'll see focal thinning often in the temporal quadrant with demyelinating disease. So it can be very, very helpful to us in this kind of situation. We're using it for our IAH patients, and this comes into your, you know, you have patients that want, have horrible headaches, they get tapped in the ER, you know, do they need a shunt? Sometimes we see those patients, we're not even certain they have papilledema, you know, and, and that's difficult to explain if they have an opening pressure of 50. Why don't they have papilledema? Well, the OCT can detect subtle papilledema better than the human eye. So it's very nice for mild to moderate papilledema. It gives us a measurement that I use to follow serially as patients are treated with Diamox weight loss or with shunting or fenestration. So it's been a very useful tool for us. We use it all the time with the pseudotumor IIH patients. For high grades of papilledema, however, it tends to not be reliable. You can't uh, interpret the OCT very well if it's a high grade. It can also distinguish between drusen versus true papilledema, and this sort of shows you the difference. They can look very similar if you look on the left there, but the side view um, of the optic nerve in the top one is more typical of papilledema, whereas with drusen, you see these sort of fingers poke, poking up like shadows that are cast like an ultrasound in the optic nerve head. And so these are very useful uh, tools to sort of separate pseudopapilledema from buried optic nerve head drusen from true papilledema. Zach, do you have a question about yeah, that? Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's at least one person in the room that does not know what an optic disc drusen is. So drusen are hyaloid bodies. They're particles that occur in 1% of the population, and they, they are crystalline, and they calcify over time. They will show up sometime asymptomatically on a CT scan of the head in the optic nerve head, and they cause peripheral vision loss that mimics glaucoma. Uh, but most patients aren't aware of it, and they don't typically affect central uh, visual acuity. And we see patients every day that are referred by optometry with questionable mild papilledema that have drusen and no papilledema. If they go to a general neurologist, they usually get brain MRI and lumbar puncture immediately. If they come to us, we often do OCT. We see them. We say, these are drusen. We explain to the patient. We, we may, typically won't even image and don't, certainly don't do a lumbar puncture. And sometimes even I can't tell the difference, and those are the patients I'll work up with MRI and, and lumbar puncture. But we see them all the time. They occur in 1% of the population. Okay, so what about nerve tumors? So for monitoring, if, you know, principal uh, primary tumors of the optic nerve, they're starting to use these screening for NF, um, NF patients who might have gliomas rather than doing MRI.
because the OCT is abnormal in those patients, even if their acuity is 20-20, and I have one now that has normal acuity, but has thinning of the nerve fiber layer and GCL layers. Here's an uh, example of that, a 52-year-old man with some visual graying out lasting 15 minutes. The ophthalmologist thought the right nerve looked pale or atrophic. He said it had been weak for years. He had no skin lesions, pretty good acuity, but he had an afferent pupillary defect and atrophy of the nerve. The field, you could argue, looks fairly normal. There's maybe a slight depression inferior there, but not very bad, and that, that could pass almost for normal. And the OCT, however, shows significant thinning of the right optic nerve in three out of four quadrants. This is the patient facing us. Left nerve looks normal. And here's the MRI, which shows what looks like a glioma. I don't know if, Dan, if you want to comment on that, but it has a sort of typical sausage-like appearance in the axial plane, and this big, the sheath is enlarged, and you know the usual sort of suspicion for glioma uh, and central increased signal of the nerve. Now, this is the most interesting article. This just came out in my professional journal in December, a, a journal of neuro-ophthalmology, and you might want to track this down, but. Um, 23 patients with chiasmal compression studied over five-year window, and they saw thinning of the ganglion cell layer that corresponds to the visual field defects, and uh, it persists even if the visual fields return to normal after surgery. And they're, they're suggesting that you might use OCT to help predict who's going to recover vision. It can be another tool besides just pre-op acuity, color vision, and field testing. So I want to show you an example of that, that a case we had here. This is a patient with 2030 in the right eye, 2400, trouble reading, color desaturation, trace disc pallor in the left eye, but a big drop in acuity. And these are the fields as the patient sees them. So you have bitemporal fields. Uh, you guys are testing for field board uh, questions, right? So in the 2400 eye, you see the field extends into the central area. So this is a junctional syndrome, good board question for neurologists. It's a junctional syndrome. You have central visual loss in the left eye, and then the other eye, you have either a superior temporal field cut or a complete temporal cut. So it's, it's highly localizing in the brain when you see this kind of thing. Uh, so I sort of knew what to expect. The OCT showed thinning of both temporal quadrants, which has been reported frequently with chiasmal lesions. And the GCL, this is just really fascinating, that you see nasal loss, which correlates with the fields per very, very nicely, mostly nasal loss. And this is what this article has shown, several examples of this. And this comes on early, before you even see nerve fiber layer loss. And I saw one of the patients uh, that has a pituitary tumor just yesterday afternoon that has normal acuity, normal fields, um, but has thinning of the ganglion cell layer nasally, uh, even though the fields don't show anything yet. So probably this is more sensitive than visual field analysis. So here's the tumor. So this is, looks like pituitary tumor, probably. And there's the little chiasm. I mean, there's the uh, optic nerve being stretched superiorly and, and especially posteriorly, I mean, on the left side. Um, and uh, postoperatively, patient did well. The vision recovered from 2400 to 2030. And there was some residual pallor. The fields improved significantly. This is pre on the left and post on the right. Not quite normal, but this was done like a month or so after surgery, so uh, may still improve further. But the GCL thinning will not improve. That, that remains. So what the question that comes up is, I think patients are going to ask you and maybe me, is uh, am I going to get my vision back after I go to the operating room? And that's a great question. And what this article states in their conclusion is, if there's significant thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer preoperatively, we're less optimistic about visual recovery than if there was a normal OCT. This has been going on longer, presumably. And in some cases, as I said, we see persistence of the thinning on GCL, even though the fields come back to normal.
So sometimes you'll see that the OCT loss precedes visual field impairment. Other times you might see loss of the fields before there's any axonal dropout, like an apoplexy case. Patient loses vision abruptly, but it's too soon to see thinning on the OCT. Whereas most of these things are growing slowly and causing compression, so you'd likely see thinning of the OCT before you start to see visual field loss. So I think it's going to be another tool. It doesn't replace visual field testing, but it's certainly going to help us a little bit in assessing patients pre- and postoperatively, and maybe getting a little better idea about uh, potential for recovery of vision after decompression of the chiasm or optic nerves.